Good morning, church. My name is Jolene Reese, and I've been a member of Penny for all my life, and it's a privilege to read the scriptures with you today. We have two scripture readings this morning. The first is from Numbers chapter 23, verses 16 through 20. You can find this in your pew Bible, starting on page number 247. The Lord met with Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, go back to Balak and give him this word. So he went to find him and found him standing beside his offering with the Moabite officials. Balak asked him, what did the Lord say? Then he spoke this message. Arise, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not human, that he should lie. Not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot change it. The second reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39 which you can find on page 1,756, and which is printed on the back of this morning's sermon insert. <clears throat> what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any change against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the man who condemns? No one, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of God. Uh, change. Change is uh, a reality that every one of us has to deal with. It is inevitable. Change is inevitable. Uh, we can't stop it. We have to learn how to live with it, especially, especially in the modern world in which everything has changed so rapidly in the past 100 years and continues to change with extraordinary speed. Change is inevitable. And one of the challenges of life is learning how to navigate changes and deal with changes. How do, how do you deal with change without becoming discouraged or disgruntled. Change is inevitable, and change is possible, uh, which is good news. Uh, A.W. Tozer once pointed out that uh, for creatures like us, imperfect, fallen creatures, the, the possibility of change is a source of hope. This is good news. You can change. Uh, your life can change. You can live a new life. You can be made into a new person. Uh, the things that have defined you and that have bound you in the past do not have to define you or bind you forever. And this is true for other people in your life and for circumstances for your life and for the church and for the state and for the world. Change is possible, but often not easy. So where do you get the strength to change? How do you keep hope alive when you're waiting for change? It takes a long time to get there. Change is inevitable, and change is possible, and we have trouble dealing with all of it. Have you noticed? Uh, we're funny. The fact that things change and keep changing is hard for us, and the fact that things don't change fast enough is hard for us. Change, we can't live with it. We can't live without it. 
in the book of Numbers, where our first reading comes from, Israel is in the wilderness. The whole book of Numbers is Israel in the wilderness. And they are struggling with the uncertainties of rapid change that has uh, uh, unsettled them. There has been rapid change of a dramatic sort. They lived for 400 years in Egypt. When they're in the book of Numbers, they don't live there anymore. They have changed where they live. The physical setting of their life has changed. They also were in slavery for many of those last years in Egypt. They're no longer enslaved. They're free. And they are free and in the wilderness, and everything is different, and it is very hard for them. If you read through the book of Numbers, at several points, multiple points in the book of Numbers, this new reality is so hard that they say to one another, even though they just left slavery, they say to one another, let's go back to Egypt. They want to go back. They would rather go back where at least we knew what was going on. Change is hard. And at the same time, they are struggling because the change that has been promised them hasn't fully been fulfilled yet. They are in the wilderness, not yet in the promised land in the book of Numbers. God had promised them a new land where they could settle. And they're longing to get there. And yet, This is confusing and challenging and frightening. The land that they're supposed to go into is full of giants, so they're not sure they want to go there. That's what they say. Big people, powerful people. They're scared to go forward. They kind of want to go back. Everything is up in the air. They are dealing with change. Change in the book of Numbers for the people of Israel is something like this. They can't live with it. They can't live without it. And in the middle of that reality, or really at the end, near the end of the book of Numbers, but in the middle of that moment in Israel's history, when they're wrestling with how, how do you, when we might be uh, encouraged to think about this and wrestle with, how do, you, how do you deal with change without becoming discouraged or disgruntled on the one hand? And on the other hand, how do you get the strength and hope to keep fighting for change and to keep waiting for change when it takes a long time? In the midst of Israel's experience of all of this comes this extraordinary statement of good news in Numbers 23, 19 to 20. 19 to 20. Excuse me. Let me just read that again, what Jolene just read. Numbers 23, and if you have a Bible, Numbers is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. Pretty much all of it. Numbers 23, 19 and 20. Listen to this statement about God. God is not a human that he should lie, and he is not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received a command to bless. God has blessed, and I cannot change it. Here is good news for people like us who have trouble dealing with change in a world that's constantly changing. Here is good news for us. Behold God, the unchanging one. The good news that Israel has is good news for us. It is found in the steadfast character of God. And this promise, this word of good news about God in verses 19 and 20 comes in the middle of a very strange story, a a funny story, a deeply encouraging story that involves a scheming king and a famous sorcerer and a mistreated donkey who begins to speak. Not joking. I want to actually tell you that story this morning. I want you to look with it and see with us what it tells us about God and this truth about God that is our central focus, that God is the God who is unchanging in his character and in his promises and in his commitment to his people. This story, again, if you have your Bibles open, it's going to help you because we're going to flip through. I want to tell you the story that leads to this statement about God's character, this strange and funny and encouraging story. It starts actually in Numbers chapter 22. And so if you turn over there, Numbers chapter 22, uh, and we read there the start of the story that places Israel where we have Uh, just where I have just told you they're at, and gives us the setting here. So if you look with me at Numbers chapter 22, then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now, this is Israel. This is Israel. It's 
are coming up to the very edge of the promised land. They're standing on the edge of the River Jordan, looking over into the promised land. They are still in the wilderness. They can see where they're going. They're not in Egypt little anymore, but they're also not in the promised land yet. And as they're in this place, this in-between place where they spend so, uh, you know, the book of Numbers, now they're, they're, they're coming to the end of it, but where they've been through the whole book of Numbers, in the wilderness. As they come to this place, their enemies are still scheming. So if you look at verse 2, now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. The, Balak, who is the king of Moab, oh, thank you, my throat is dry, as happens in the winter. Uh, as they come up to the edge of the land, uh, their enemy, the king of Moab, is looking at them and sees, sees them and is scared of them. He is uh, terrified of what they might do, and so he begins to scheme against them. He actually has a plan to take them out. Look at uh, verse 4, right at the end of it. So having seen them and being scared, with, scared of them, filled with dread because of them, Balak, son of Zippor, who was the king of Moab at that time, sent messengers, verse 5, to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor near the Euphrates River in his native land. And Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land, have settled next to me. Now come, put a curse on these people because they're too powerful for me." He has a plan to attack them and to actually uh, take them out, and the plan starts with going and getting the services of this man, Balaam. Who's Balaam? Balaam, interesting character, who's actually known outside of the Bible in the ancient Near East. He was actually a famous, uh, there, there's extra-biblical confirmation of his life and uh, famous um, his fame, his fame throughout the ancient world. He was a sorcerer and a practice, practitioner of divination. These were skills that were highly, uh, highly prized in the ancient Near East. Divination was the practice of trying to discern the secret will of the gods uh, through the use of signs and omens. And sorcery, which he also practices, it says, was the use of incantations and magic and ritual to change the course of events by influencing the gods. He is the guy you hire when you want to curse your enemy. But the way you curse them is interesting and very relevant for the story. What exactly does Balak hire Balaam to do? And here's, here's, here's at the heart of what is the, the drama of the story. What, what Balak is hiring Balaam to do is not just to put some kind of an other curse on him. He is hiring Balaam to go and to break up the relationship between Israel and their God. There was an understanding in the ancient Near East that if your God was with you, was pleased with you, there, your God would bless you. But if your God would, could be turned against you, your God would curse you. If your God is with you, of course, your God's going to stand up for you. But if your God, your God, and every people had their God, if your God could be broken away from you, uh, they, they would turn on you and curse you. And what Balaam is hired to do is to go and see if he can break up Israel and their God. So look, uh, when they send... Uh, the, look, verse 7, the elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination, Balaam's fee. And when they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Look at verse 8, Balaam said, spend the night here and I'll report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. The Lord, when you see Lord in all caps, that is God's name. That is the name of Israel's God. Balaam is going to Israel's God and saying, can can we move you? Can we turn you against your own people? Can we move you? Can we sway you? Can we get you to turn against your own people and now, instead of blessing them, because we see they're blessed, curse them? Balaam is hired to break up God and his people. And the early indications are that's not going to work. Uh, he goes to him, and uh, God says, uh, no, no, I'm not going to do it. And so Balaam goes back. Uh, verse 12, God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You are not to put a curse on those people because they are blessed. And so he goes back and says, nope, sorry, it's not going to work. This God won't turn against his people. And so the messengers go back to Balak, the king, uh, 
But the story is not over. Balak is a king, and kings don't usually take no for an answer very easily. And so Balak says, let me try again. And he sends another delegation back. Keep following with me. It says in verse 15, then Balak sent other officials, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. And they came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak, son of Zippor, says, do not let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. Balak sweetens the pot. He sends more uh, famous, more noble, more important people back to Balaam, playing on Balaam's pride. And he gives Balaam a promise. I'll write you a blank check if you'll do this for me, anything you want, playing on Balaam's greed. And Balaam says, let me see what I can do. Look at verse 18. Balaam answered them, even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now spend the night here so I can go and find out what else the Lord will tell me. Now, this is not exactly no. Do you know? <laughs> Did you notice that? He says, uh, but you know, I, I can't go beyond what this God is going to do, what he's going to say. But you know, let me go talk to him and see what we can work out. I wouldn't want to say no too quickly to all of you important people and to this incredibly impressive financial offer. And so he goes and speaks to the Lord, verse 20. And that night, God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. And the alert reader of the book of Numbers at this point, this is, this is a wonderful story. story as the, the alert reader, if you've been reading the book of Numbers at this point, you might begin to wonder exactly what is going on. God says to Balaam, go with the men who want to hire you to curse my people, who want to break you up. Is God wavering? And here's why you might wonder that, particularly if you've been reading the book of Numbers. It is not only that God, that, that Israel has enemies on the outside who are coming in trying to break up the relationship between God and his people, put pressure on it. It is not only that. Israel itself has done plenty to break up their relationship with God. If you read the book of Numbers... What you find is story after story of Israel's bad behavior. Should I give you a list? You've been reading numbers recently? You don't? Let's think of this. Chapter 11, the people begin grumbling. They begin saying, after God has brought them out of Egypt, we want to go back to Egypt because they grumble because the food that they get is too boring. It's just manna. And then God gives them quail and they grumble because there's too much quail. They grumble. In chapter 12, Moses and Aaron, um, excuse me, Miriam and Aaron, two leaders, uh, other leaders in Israel, rebel against Moses because of his interracial marriage and because they're jealous of his position. They grumble against him, making God mad. They start to rebel against God's authority and the role that God has given Moses. That's chapter 11, then chapter 12. Then in chapter 13, 12 spies are sent to the promised land. Do you remember this story? To spy out the, the land that God gave Israel. And they come back. God had said, I'm going to give you this land. And 10 of the 12 come back and say, I don't care what God said. There's no way we're going to take that land. And the people say, you're right. We can't believe God. It goes on like this. Chapter 16, chapter 20, all the way down to chapter 20, where Israel again grumbles about uh, not having water, makes Moses so mad that he loses his temper, speaks rashly, strikes a rock, brings down God's wrath, and the place where that all happens is a place called quarreling, because Israel quarreled with God. Story after story in Numbers is the story of Israel not trusting God, not obeying God, not respecting God's authority, not doing what God told them to do, making God mad, making God's servants mad. The whole story of Numbers to this point, almost, has been the story of Israel's failure to honor the God who loves them. And so when God says, you know, go with them, might you think at that point, you know, maybe God is going to take a better offer. Uh, Israel's God tells Balaam to go, this internationally renowned consultant to the gods, experienced practitioner of divination, giver of curses, spiritual destroyer of peoples. And you might wonder, 
Does God change in his commitment to people who are a mess? Does God change in his fail in his promises when the people he made the promises to fail to keep their promises to him? Can God be swayed in his commitment to his people? And you see the spiritual stakes here. Uh, This is the drama of the Bible. It's the drama of our lives as well. According to the Bible, life on this earth is not a playground. It's, it's It's a battlefield. It's a spiritual battlefield. The Bible says... Uh, that we have enemies, we face serious temptations, accusations, assaults, uh, designed to break us apart, to break us away from God. There's a real tempter, we have a real enemy of our souls, who's working to separate us from God, to tempt us and to accuse us. And and you know, uh, I've heard it said that the the devil's one-two punch in coming after us, in attempting to break us away from God, the devil has a one-two punch. The, the, the first punch setting us up when you're facing temptation is to lie to us and tell us, you know, this isn't that big of a deal. And then you do it, and the devil's real second punch is, now you've done it, God will never forgive you. Not that big of a deal, God will never forgive you now. Accusation, temptation. And we fail. Can God be moved? Can he be swayed? Can he be enticed to move from Israel? The stakes are high. The question is a big question. And so let's, but this is where the story takes a humorous turn. Go back to Balaam. Balaam is now on the road. He's probably feeling pretty good. Um, He's riding with a distinguished group of important people. You ever been around a bunch of important people? I mean, here you are with a bunch of important people right here. Kind of makes you feel good, you know. He's riding with all these important dignitaries. His, uh, and and though, I think what we know from later in reading the story is that uh, is what is going on with, with Balaam in Balaam's mind. And it's kind of roughly this. His eyes are full of dollar signs. He's think, thinking, this God has said, go, I'm going to get to do this, and I am going to get to make bank. Uh, Second Peter speaks of Balaam. Balaam's spoken of a few places and says uh, he loved the wages of wickedness. He loved money. And he seems to have thought, uh, he seems to have heard uh, only what he wanted to hear. God said go, so Balaam went, uh, but God did not say go and curse. God said go and do only what I tell you to do. But Balaam is hearing only what he wants to hear. He wants to go and get what will make him some money. And so he heads out Uh, And he is on the way, and he's thinking he knows where this whole story is going. Uh, And so, uh, but 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 he's wrong. And so, to make sure that Balaam knows uh, what is actually going on, that Balaam has to still listen to God before he speaks, God stops him in his tracks to make sure Balaam knows, doesn't get off course. That Balaam knows. Hold on, that's not what I said. I didn't say go and curse. I said go and do what I want to do. God stops him, and the way God stops him is through this uh, famous story. Uh, of Balaam and his donkey. Now, do you know the story? It's a great story. Uh, God sent an angel with a sword to stop Balaam in his tracks. And uh, so the angel came, the story says, and, and stood. I'll tell you the story. You can read it this afternoon if you want in chapter 22. The angel came and stood in the path of Balaam and his donkey. And this is where things start to get embarrassing for Balaam. It was an embarrassing day for Balaam. Uh, It starts to get embarrassing because uh, the angel came and stood in his path, and Balaam, who's supposedly this wise spiritual guru, can't see the angel that's in front of him. He's supposed to be the one who knows all about the gods. He's a spiritual expert. He can't see spiritual reality right in front of him. Number one, that's embarrassing. Number two, even more embarrassing, his donkey can see it. He can't see it. His donkey can. And so his donkey uh, begins to take... Uh, evasive action. He actually, the first time the, 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 the angel's in the path, and the donkey goes off to the side into a field. And Balaam is furious. He says later he's furious because he's being made to look like a fool. He's a proud man riding with impo- important people. And so his donkey goes off the path, and Balaam beats his donkey and gets him back onto the path. 
And then the angel, so the angel moves forward and takes up a place again in front of Balaam and his donkey. And this time, it's at a place in the path where the path is narrow and there's actually walls for a vineyard on both sides. And again, the donkey, who sees what Balaam doesn't, takes evasive action. He lurches to the side, and Balaam's foot is crushed against the wall. And Balaam is now extra mad. He looks like a fool. This hurts. So he beats the donkey again, second time. Third time. The angel goes up, moves to the front of the path to stop this trajectory, this, to stop Balaam in his tracks. And, and this time, the path is so narrow that the donkey can't go to the right or to the left. The only way to go is forward, and the angel is in the path, and so the, Balaam, and so the donkey lays down in the path and won't move. And, and this is... Uh, the worst for Balaam, He's, he, this whole, probably we're to assume that the whole important delegation has been watching him, little eye roll, they're looking at each other like, what's going on with this guy? You know, he's, and so he loses it. Uh, he uh, actually begins to, uh, to just lay into the donkey. He's hitting the donkey, and then the Bible says, uh, the Lord opened the donkey's mouth. Now, you may have questions about how this happened. Uh, or what all of this means. But isn't it wonderful to think that it did? It's the only time in the Bible where this is said. The donkey is given a human voice. That's what Second Peter says. An animal without speech spoke with a human voice. What did the donkey say? Are you curious? What would, what would your donkey say if it could speak? The, the, the donkey asked a question. The donkey said, this is what the Bible said, the donkey said, what have I done to make you beat me these three times? And here's the, the point. Balaam is, so, is it, Balaam is so irrationally angry, he starts to argue with the donkey. He says, you made a fool of me. If I had a sword, I'd kill you. And the donkey answers and starts speaking sense to Balaam. Let me just, this is what he says. The donkey says, look, I'm, he asks him a question. He says, I'm your donkey. Uh, you ride me all the time, right? Balaam says, yes. I don't usually do this to you, do I? Balaam says, no, right? This is the worst. Now it's even more embarrassing. Number one, Balaam is arguing with the donkey. Number two, the donkey's winning the argument. He's completely made a fool of. And, and at the end of this whole point is the, this whole uh, thing. God opens... Balaam's eyes, he sees the angels, and this is what the story says. Look down at verse 32. The angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I came here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me, turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I have spared it. Look down at verse 35. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with these men, but speak only what I tell you. Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. This whole long, wonderful story that actually has some other points as well focuses us on one thing. Remember the big question. Can God be broken away from his promises? Can God be turned against his people? Can God's steadfast love and holy character and goodness ever be changed by anyone? And here is what happens. God, the, all, this whole story is to focus our attention on one thing. What will God say? What will God say? And what does God say? When they get up to the mountain in chapter 23, where they are looking down on Israel. And their Israel is down below them, and Balak and their enemies are there plotting against them, and Balaam comes up to speak for the first time. Look at chapter 23. This is his message. Balak is waiting. He's got Balaam there. He thinks he is going to curse God's people. In verse 5, it says, the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, go back to Balak and give him this word. Verse 7, then Balaam spoke his message. Balak brought me from Aram, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come, he said, denounce Israel. But how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? 
What will God say about his people? With all this water under the bridge, with all these enemies attacking, with all the failures of Israel lined up and told to us, will God change in his fundamental character, in his steadfast love, in his promises to his people? What will God say now? He will say exactly the same thing he said in the past because his character does not change. What will God do toward his people? Will he be moved or swayed from them? No, because he does not change in his love. He does not change in his mercy. He does not change in his commitment to his people. He is not a human that he should lie. He is not a human being that he should change his, his mind. He does not speak and not act. He does not promise and not fulfill. The whole long story The end of Numbers is to bring us to this point and this truth about God. He's the unchanging God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in fact, when when Balaam begins to speak of them, it's actually uh, beautiful, some of the things that he says. We'll get to that in a moment. But just think for a moment with the questions we started with. If we can't live with change and we can't live without it, how are we to deal with this world? And and the, the, the statement, the promise, the truth of the Scripture is this, that we can deal with all of the changes of this world and we can deal with waiting for and fighting for the changes we need because we have this foundation on which to stand, a God who does not change. Change is inevitable, but we can face those changes. Because God's character doesn't change. I wonder what the changes are that you're struggling with the most right now. Uh, The truth of the matter is that the inevitability of change is something we have to accept. Nothing in this world, nothing in this world stays the same forever. And the, the older I get, the more I'm aware of that. And there's no going back to the way things were before. The only place we have to live is right now. That's it. There's no good in dreaming about going back to a place where we used to be that we imagine is better. The only place, the only time we have to live is now. The only time to love God is now. The only time to love other people is now. The only time to live by faith is now. The only time to obey God is now. We can't miss out on what God has given us right now because we're dreaming of the future or we're dreaming of the past. The future will be different. The past was different. What we have is right now. And to face right now, we have a God whose mercies are new every morning, whose promises are true every day, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can face change with a God who does not change and who is with us. Jesus Christ that you see, the Jesus you see in the Gospels is the same Jesus who walks with you today. In his mercy toward those who are sinners, in his power toward those who are broken, in his forgiveness for those who have fallen short. Same Jesus. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Change is inevitable. We can face it because God doesn't change. And change is possible. Because God's commitment to his people never changes. I love the third oracle, so turn over to chapter 24. Balaam actually speaks a bunch of times. If we had all day, we'd look at all of them. I just want to show you one more. Look at chapter 24. Balaam goes up a number of times, actually seven times he goes up to speak. And it's actually funny in and of itself because Balak says, Please curse them. And then he goes up and he blesses the people. And then Balak says, Ah, I was trying to get you to curse them. Let's try that again. Curse them this time. And he blesses them again. This happens seven times. The third time, though, uh, this is what we see. Look at chapter 24. Now, when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not resort to divination as at other times, but he turned his face toward the wilderness. And when Balaam looked out and saw Israel encamped tribe by tribe, now he's looking out in this desert wilderness at Israel in their camps. 
The Spirit of God came on Balaam, and he spoke this message. Now, I just want you to understand what's going on and then see this. Balaam comes in, and this time he doesn't try any of his tricks, any of his divination. He realizes he cannot stop this God from blessing his people. He can't be broken away. And so he just looks out in Israel, and the, and the text says the Holy Spirit comes on Balaam, and he begins to prophesy now by the Holy Spirit in a new way. And he's looking out on a desert land at a people who are a royal mess. And this is what he says, filled with the Holy Spirit. The prophecy of Balaam, verse 3, son of Beor, the prophecy of one whose eye sees clearly, the prophecy of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate and whose eyes are open. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob. Your dwelling place is Israel. Like valleys they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by God, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their seed will have abundant water, he goes on. Do you see what's happening? Filled with the Holy Spirit, Israel, Balaam looks out at people who are a mess, but now he sees them as God intends them to be and will make them to be because of his covenant promises. Now he looks out at a people who are a mess and he sees them being beautiful. Now he looks out at a people who are in a desert and he sees their land becoming an oasis. Now he sees by the Holy Spirit a vision into who the people of God are, not because of who they are, but because of who they belong to. Because of the God who will work in them, who has begun a good work and will bring it to completion. He looks at a desert and sees a garden. He looks at a people who are a mess and says they're beautiful. Because God is the unchanging God. He had promised to bless. He would not fail to bless. Until his people became everything he was making them to be. God does not change. And so... We can fight for the change that we need. And here you see, don't you see, that God is not, that Jesus, when Jesus Christ came, he was not, this was not God being somehow different or doing something completely different in terms of his care for his people. Jesus does not represent a change in God's plans. Uh, No, God's plan has always been to pursue a people by grace, to take hold of them in his pursuing love, and to make them in grace and truth, into what they could never become on their own. God's plan from the beginning was to take rebels and make them children of God, to take people who are spiritually filthy and make them clean, to take the messed up people and make them beautiful, to make a desert an oasis. And so when Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for your sin and mine, that was not the God of Israel changing. That was the God of Israel keeping his promise. And when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and said, you will have new life in me, that was not, that was fundamentally something new in the world, but it was not something new in the mind of God. He intended and still intends to call a people to himself, to save them by his grace and to transform them into something fundamentally beautiful. And you can trust that because the God who did that yesterday, who sent Jesus Christ, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, is the same God today he has always been. And he cannot, cannot be shaken off of his plan or broken in his love for his people. Is change hard? Yes, often. Do we often have to wait for it? Yes. Do we often have to wait longer than we want? Yes. But the good change of freedom from the sin that binds you and transformation into the very character of Jesus and healing for the deepest wounds of this earth and the day when the kingdom will come finally on earth as it is in heaven, that change is coming because God has promised it and he does not lie. Do not lose heart. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Because the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And because if you have trusted Jesus, nothing can separate you from his love. He told you he loved you. He has shown you he loves you at the cross. And nothing will ever change his mind. Would you pray with me?